Jeffrey Slovis, and I'm going to talk about some of my favorite things, things that sometimes work and often don't in cardiac arrest. Epinephrine, bicarbonate, and calcium. I have absolutely no disclosures. This is our job. Secure the ABCs. Regardless of our role, airway, breathing, cardiovascular stability, every time, every patient, unless they're DNR or have an advanced directive or a post. First drug, epinephrine. Epinephrine is the drug of choice. One milligram, Q3 to 5, this is the American Heart Association, ACLS, AHA, ACC recommendation. And here, just published last year, is the International Liaison Committee. We recommend the administration of epinephrine during CPR, a strong recommendation. And what they do is they separate shockable and non-shockable rhythms. Strong recommendation for for non-shockable rhythms as soon as possible. For shockable rhythms, they recommend that we go ahead and wait until we have defibrillated multiple times. All of this data is based on studies done on small mongrel dogs in Baltimore and at Hopkins and University of Maryland. And these were 10 to 20, 10 to 15 kilogram dogs. And what they found was that epinephrine, one milligram of epinephrine was the best in very small dogs, which is why we use one milligram. They used it in 10 kilo dogs. We use it in 100 kilogram patients. The administration of epinephrine, our current recommendations are really based on a small number of mongrel dogs. Not that there's anything wrong with mongrels, just they're 10 kilos. The use of epinephrine has been questioned for a long time. Here it, it's questioned in 1965. I questioned the choice of epinephrine as the drug in cardiac arrest. How effective is epi? We need to appreciate that epinephrine has goodness and badness. I don't want to quote older literature, so let me quote older literature. In 1998, a study, one of Ian Steele's earlier studies, showed that epinephrine decreased survival in cardiac arrest versus no epinephrine. In another study, looking at airway management called ACLS, but no meds, it turned out that when you looked at just airway management, versus airway management plus epi, atropine, and amiodarone, epi once again decreased uh, survival. It improved return to spontaneous circulation, but it decreased survival. Here's a meta-analysis. I'm not going to belabor it. This is what they found. This is 12 studies. No difference, no difference, no difference, whether you use high dose, regular dose, handed vasopressin. It's hard to show that epi makes a huge difference based on the available studies. One thing is clear, though. Although it's unclear how effective epinephrine is, and I'm going to get into the, the study that really looked at it, the sooner you give it in non-shockable rhythms, the more likely you are to get a pulse back. If you have asystole or PEA, oxygenate and get epi on board quickly. Don't waste time. Now, I want to contrast that to something that's really important and well-studied. It does not apply to shockable rhythms. This is a study from Get With The Guidelines. And what they did is they looked at giving epi before or after two shocks. Please understand that if you give epi very early in VFib and don't allow defibrillation to at least be attempted two or three times, here it was two times, you will decrease the return to spontaneous circulation. You will decrease survival. You will decrease good neuro outcomes. Wait in VFib shock, two minutes of CPR shock. Then you can consider epinephrine. There's no question about what I've just said. Up until recently, there hasn't been a great study. We've been basing it on studies from the 60s. And so this is the study. What is the role of epinephrine in cardiac arrest? The only large double-blind placebo-controlled trial. 8,000 patients, about 4,000 got epinephrine. They looked at survival and neuro outcomes, and this is what they found. 
epinephrine increases return of spontaneous circulation, epinephrine increases the likelihood of getting to the hospital and essentially triple the likelihood of being admitted. Epinephrine works if you look at it as far as, in fact, survival. So I don't want to dispute this. Epinephrine increases survival in cardiac arrest. BFib, epinephrine increases survival uh, in PEA. Epinephrine increases survival in asystole. But you need to look a little bit closer. And that is when you look at neurologically intact, whether it's ranking zero to two or zero to three, there's no difference. It increases survival. It doesn't increase good neuro survival. And that's really important because when you look at severe neurologic disability, epinephrine increases that too. So if you increase survival, but not good neuro, and you've got to increase bad neuro. And ranking four and five means you cannot feed yourself. You cannot toilet. You cannot ambulate. You are bedbound, comatose, and or on, on a tube feed. So these results have been looked at later on, both at six and 12 months. And so I just want to make a couple of key points as we look at the rational use of epinephrine. If you use epi in the 8,000 patients, 20 more people will have favorable neurologic outcome. At the same time, 11 more patients will be left neurologically devastated if they get epi rather than placebo. There's almost one quarter more neurologically devastated patients at six months who are treated with epi rather than placebo. So I want to do three conclusions on the use of epi. Here's a positive one, and this is all three are true. Epinephrine and out of hospital cardiac arrest improves return of spontaneous circulation and the likelihood for hospital discharge. Here's a more neutral one Epinephrine does not improve neurologically intact survival in out of hospital cardiac arrest. And if you're an anti epi kind of guy or girl, epinephrine just increases the likelihood of being neurologically devastated without significantly increasing the number of neurologically intact. So, I like to have a clear conclusion, so I got an unclear one. Even after a large double-blind placebo-controlled trial, the role of epi is still hotly debated and absolutely not definitively defined. However, maybe we're given too much epi. So I want to tell you about, very briefly, a one-and-done study. They were running out of epi. They rationed it. So they had about 800, 799 people in North Carolina that got one dose of epi. And then they compare that to 900, 899 patients who got multi-dose standard epi. This is what they found. Multi-dose epi, 38.3%. As far as ROSC, less ROSC with just one dose of epi. Core point, if you want to get a pulse back, epi will do it. However, when they looked at survival to hospital discharge, look at this. There was no difference. I, I know it's 9.9 .9 versus more with single dose, but this is not statistically significantly different. Epinephrine did not increase the likelihood of survival to hospital discharge, and it absolutely didn't increase favorable neurologic outcome. Epi will get your pulse back. Epi does not guarantee getting your brain back. And this is what I think. We need a study. No epi versus single dose epi versus multi dose epi done with a large number of people in multiple sites throughout the United States. We need a definitive study. All right, final epi thing, and I'm out. Let's do some bicarb and calcium. This just recently appeared in chest, and I'm not going to go through everything, but this is 18 trials, almost 22,000 patients. This is the conclusion I want to leave you with. Standard dose epinephrine may have no effect on survival with good neuro, compared to no treatment. I think that's the conclusion we have right now. What does this mean for you? What does it mean for our patients? If you have someone who has unwitnessed cardiac arrest and you can get an echo probonum and they have no cardiac motion after a couple of doses, two or three doses of epi, stop. If you have an unwitnessed asystolic arrest, even if you don't have uh, ultrasound has shown no cardiac motion. Unwitnessed asystole, 
multiple doses of epi, my bias is two or three, stop. And for PEA, I look at end tidal CO2. If it's not going up and the heart rate is going down, you're done. For VFib, I only give one dose. Some people give no doses of epi and be aggressive with VFib and pulses VTAC. But for those rhythms that are not shockable, use epinephrine judiciously. All right. I want to talk about two things. I know we don't have much time, but I, I want to give you the state-of-the-art review of bicarbonate, including a very recent article. Bicarbonate should work. Bicarbonate is a base. We're acidotic in cardiac arrest. And that's what Max Harry Weil and colleagues showed in the important paper from 1986. I know, long time ago. What they showed is on the arterial side, the blue. You give bicarb, you are cruising. pH 7.1 during cardiac arrest. But look at the venous pH, 7.15, and that's due to venous hypercarbia. Bicarbonate in cardiac arrests raises arterial pH, but it generates CO2 that lays in the capillary bed and venous system, and you create a hypercarbic acidosis throughout the body. For that reason, you shouldn't get bicarb. But wait, there's more. This is from resuscitation. 15,000 patients comparing bicarb to no bicarb. Propensity scoring, trying to make the patient groups equal. And this is what they found. Take a look. With bicarb, you are less likely to have survival. With bicarb, most importantly, you are less likely to have a good neuro outcome. Bicarbonate is not good in cardiac arrest. And it's class three by the American Heart. So what does that mean? It means that people still debate it. This is, to me, the definitive study. I'm sorry. This is one more study than I do the definitive study. This is a systematic review, and, and they found the same thing. Bicarbonate doesn't work. But people still debate it. Pediatricians, especially PICU people, like to give it. Here's a meta-analysis decrease of 60% in pediatric cardiac arrest. I think there's no role for bicarbonate in cardiac arrest unless it's due to a tricyclic, unless it's due to a sodium channel blocker. Don't give it. There's no role for it. Hyper-K, giddy up. Some overdoses, absolutely. So my take home is, don't give it. It doesn't improve survival. It decreases it. But people continue to use it. Before I close on this, I want to tell you about a very controversial study. This study used an EMS database, the ESO database. This is more than 1,300 EMS agencies throughout the entire United States. It's retrospective. They just, it's a data pool. And what they did is they looked at the 28.3% of people that got, that got bicarb versus no bicarb. Bicarbonate didn't work in VF, VF, VF pulses VCAC. But it did work, in quotes, as far as survival and return of spontaneous circulation and asystole, and it worked to increase survival in PEA. However, please note, this is data from 1968 from the original dog studies. If you're really acidotic late in the arrest, epinephrine works better if you give bicarb. And so this study gave bicarb about 30 minutes into the code, long after I would have stopped in asystole and PEA. And so I worry that bicarbonate may just improve rust, but it may not have any effect on someone who's been dead for 30 minutes. And so please be careful until there is a good study, an outcome study looking at neuro outcomes where it's bicarb versus no bicarb. Bicarb's a killer. Don't use it. Last. Very briefly, calcium. I grew up using calcium in cardiac arrest, but I think I'm close to 100 years old by now. Calcium is a dangerous drug. Here's an article from 2014. It says, don't use it. There is no evidence that it works to improve survival. But that's old stuff. This is a study that I really think is an important one for those of you that want to use calcium in any cardiac arrest. I'm not talking hyperkalemia white QRS. I'm not talking about overdoses. This is, does calcium work in cardiac arrest? This is a Danish study. It is double blind, 
placebo controlled, really impeccably well done. They used between three quarters to one and a half amps of calcium chloride. They had to stop the study. The data safety monitoring board stopped the study. And the reason they stopped it was appalling results giving calcium. Almost a 50% improvement in return of spontaneous circulation with no calcium. Almost a 50% improvement in 30-day survival if you did not give calcium. And most importantly, essential doublet of neurologically intact survival with no calcium. Calcium is a killer. Don't use it. But people keep using it. I, I don't know what to say. Final study, pediatric use in cardiac arrest, 1,100 uh, pediatric cardiac arrests, 18 ICUs nationwide. Almost half got calcium. And let me tell you what they found. Don't give calcium is what they found. P-values, 0 0.038, 0.038. Statistically significant improvement in ROSC and most importantly, favorable neuro discharges, almost double. Take homes on calcium, just like bicarb. Don't use it routinely. Absolutely renal failure, especially fun dialysis or you see a wide QRS. If you see a sine wave, giddy up. But other than that, these drugs by carbon calcium are not designed to save lives and brains. To quote Nancy Reagan, which I don't like to do, just say no to calcium. I'm not talking about sine waves or hyper I'm not talking about hypocalcemia or beta or calcium channel blocker overdose. Let me make five summary points, and I appreciate you all being patient with me. Epinephrine is still the drug of choice in cardiac arrest. It improves ROSC admissions. It even improves hospital discharge. Doesn't increase overall neural neurologically intact survival. And it's unclear how much to give. Don't keep giving it to dead people or you'll get back a dead person with a pulse. Be judicious. No termination of resuscitation protocols. And please just say no to routine bicarbonate and calcium in cardiac arrest, not special patients. I know all patients are special. Unless there's a reason to give it, not we tried everything, nothing's worked. That's not a reason. Our job is to secure the ABCs. Unless the patient is DNR, has an advanced directive or a post, we need to save lives or allow someone to die with dignity who is no longer viable. It has been a privilege to talk to you. Thank you very much. Oh, no.